We're going to talk about the spiritual temple this morning, the spiritual temple. And I'd like you to open your Bibles again to 2 Corinthians, for those of you who have your Bibles, 2 Corinthians, and we're going to look at chapter 6 and verse 16. Second Corinthians chapter six sixteen, <clears throat> and it says, "And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for bringing us here together to listen to your word this morning. I just ask one thing, Father, and that you hide me behind you. That what they might see, dear Father, might not be me, but they might see Christ through me. We ask that the words might be used to edify, and everything that we learn today that we can apply to our lives in a practical way. We ask these things in your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, when we talk about the spiritual temple, you know, let me go back a little bit, and we're kind of going to go back to when Jesus was still here on the earth. And we look at the cleansing of the temple that Jesus did, if you all remember that scene. And it's in the cleansing of the temple, it said Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah. And entering upon his work, that temple erected for the abode of the divine presence was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy seraph to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple of God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the Divine One. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity, and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again His temple. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny of open to every soul. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building they regarded with so much pride they did not yield themselves as holy temples for the divine spirit. So this morning, our, our topic is going to touch about the spiritual temple. As, as much as you might know, the spiritual temple is pertaining to our physical bodies, a spiritual body. Because we are not a physical temple like we would see here, four walls and, and a roof, right? And when we talk about the temple, we can discuss, and there's many things to discuss, right? Uh, you can talk about the deep, profound, and meetable aspects of the religious services, the articles, the furniture, the feast, the system, the sacrifices, and the offerings that went along with it. Without doubt, one of them, the focal point of the temple, uh, when, when, when God had uh, purposed in his heart to do this, is it was to uh, lay out the extraordinary plan of salvation to man. And it was done in figures of things to come and in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it even goes on further than just the, 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 the earthly uh, things, but also goes into the heavenly things where Christ ascended, where he is now doing a work on behalf of man in the most holy place. Now, I want to focus, and, and the study today is not to focus so much on, on, the, on, the, on the services and everything that went along with the temple, but um, we, we want to kind of look at you know, the, the tabernacle slightly that was built in, in the desert and compare that to the temple that was built by Solomon posthumously after that. So it is my hope and prayer this morning that we can practically put these things to work and the lessons that we are taught, you know, uh, we can learn them by the help of the Holy Spirit. So let us start off with the tabernacle in the desert. Now, when we think about the tabernacle in the desert, what, what did God instruct Moses to make? We all know God told Moses and if you want, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25. And we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. And this is going to delineate or tell us the purpose of why God asked Moses to construct or to build him a temple. Exodus 25, verses 8 and 9. And the Bible says, it says, And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them, according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the tab pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall he make it. So what was the purpose of God asking Moses to build this temple? Okay, amen. Because God wanted 
to dwell among them, between them, right? And we know, as well as the Hebrew people back then knew, that with an all-powerful God, you couldn't really make a building for him to fit in, you know? It is sometimes a, a, a contradictory statement to think that God is so big, you know, and yet so small that he can dwell in our hearts, right? It's almost like it, it's, it ceases to, to fathom and kind of boggle the mind to see how God can do that. But we know that God was not meant to dwell in a building made by human hands. It has a, it, but the, the, the building had a purpose, it said, of proportioning a visible center for worship of, one, of the one and only true God, and it constituted a stronghold against idol worship. So God said, you know what, I'm going to build a temple so you can see my visible presence, but it was also a purpose was to say to them, you know what, I don't want you going over here and worshiping these idols. It's almost like giving somebody something to do, right? And in this case, it was a tabernacle that God gave his people. He said, it brought God near to his people at the same time providing protection against idolatry. You know, it's, it's, it's a significant note that the word sanctuary, if you ever see the word sanctuary, it was never applied to any pagan temples. It was very singular and very specific to God's temple. And it, the reason why, is said, as God is looking to make his dwelling place, it's the hearts of his people, and then in the midst of those, he assembled to worship him in spirit and truth. Said so the system that centralized in the earthly sanctuary foreshadowed Christ who later dwelled and made his habitation among men. John 1.14 says that God was made flesh and he what? Dwelt, dwelt among the people. Said so in, in the Hebrew there's a word called shakan or the word dwell. And the word means that it's something to dwell permanently in a specific location. So if you see the word dwell that God wanted to do, it wasn't so much of a building, right? Because God didn't want to dwell in a building. Wouldn't it be sad if we came Sabbath after Sabbath and God was only here? And we had to come meet with him because his presence was only here? You think that was God's purpose? God's purpose was initially that he wanted to dwell where? In the hearts of men. But in this case, he had to build a temple and say, you know what? I'm going to visibly manifest myself to my people. And it says that God emphasized to Moses, and, 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 and I'm go on. It said God emphasized to Moses to make this temple according to the pattern shown him. What model was he referring to? We don't have to go to the verse, but the Bible tells us that God gave him a model of what? A heavenly sanctuary, a pattern that was above, not on earth, right? Which is one of the tenets of our faith that we know that God is currently in that heavenly sanctuary right now. If you look at the Bible, we get confirmation from Paul. He says that these things were made after the heavenly. If we look at John in the book of Revelation, John says that he saw the heavenly sanctuary as well, and Jesus currently ministering in our behalf, where the earthly was just but a mere copy. When Moses was tasked to do this great work for God in building the sanctuary, right, there was a concern that came over Moses. What concern was that? Let's look at Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 and 6. After God said, Moses, I want you to build me my temple, Moses had a little bit of a concern. In Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 and 6, it says the following. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, and the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled them with the spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold and silver and in brass, and in cutting of stones, to set them, and in carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, have given with him Aholiab, the son of Ahimsahak, the tribe of Dan, and in the heart of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee. Now, Moses had a concern. He was probably thinking to himself, who is going to build this tabernacle? Right? I sure can't work with stone. I don't know how to beat metal into precious stuff. I don't know how to cut wood. So God says that he himself did what? He called them by name. Right? The people that were take the labor of constructing the sanctuary. He called them by name. Now, 
the questions was who, who could do this work and who was sufficient for these things? God knew. God had already called them. God already specified in his mind. He had already had an idea even before Moses even thought about it. God said, I'm going to proportion these men to work. He said, it was interesting to think, though, that the people that he had called to work, and perhaps it's almost like somebody that you've never seen do a specific work, you know? And these people had previously been, what, doing in what in Egypt? What, what's the greatest thing they probably built in Egypt? Bricks, right? They constructed bricks out of straws. And, and he, perhaps they didn't, you know, maybe in his mind he's like, who's going to build this, right? Who knows how to do these things? It, it's, a, it's a concern, but God had already provided for those things. Yeah. And he said that God had called these people by name. And, and it's interesting to note, and I want to bring this out, he said, God only calls by name those whom he asks a special service. He said, being children of his people, or in all cases Gentiles, that although do recognize him as God, he gives them the privilege to work to accomplish his desires, and at the same time, he gives them opportunities to know him so they may honor and glorify him by obedience from their, for their own salvation. It's amazing how God, when he calls you by name, it's not because he just calls you. Right? It's not like uh, some guy that says, hey, you come over here, hey, you come over here. It's because he has what? Special work for you to do. And he did the same with Moses and the people that were to build this tabernacle. Now, when we look at the materials that were used for the labor that would be taken, you know, we know that when the exodus happened, you know, God had told the Israelites to do what? Ask of the Egyptians to give them what? Precious stones, gold, silver. They asked all kinds of things when they left, and it was God's purpose to do this. It was to be costly materials that the people were offer, and only an offering, what kind of offering did God request? The Bible says he had requested a voluntary and a free will offering from the, from the heart. God was not going to ask. He was not going to twist. He was not going to pull. He was going to say, only those that want to give free will be doing so. And it's interesting that the generosity at this point that the Israelites displayed, um, you know, the inspired pen says that there was something to behold, and it says that probably will be something that will never be equaled by Christians subsequently. It was such a great amount. They said they gave almost everything they had. Can you imagine giving up almost everything you have and saying, here, Lord, this is for the construction of the new church? How many of us would do that? It's difficult, especially when you have a lot of things. You know, but he said that they gave precious duels, jewels they had taken and, and said they had very little riches. You know, and there was no promising avenues to enrich themselves any further, but they had before them an aim to build a tabernacle for God. I remember a story, you know, my dad used to tell uh, us, and, and uh, I hear it from other people too, so not just him telling me the story. But uh, back when, uh, you know, we were in L.A., the church that we used to belong to, it was a Spanish church. And it was one of the first, or I would say, one of the second Spanish churches in the area, right? And, uh, you know, they had uh, previously met in a really small building. You know, I don't know how much smaller it is, um, but it, it was small. And they said they finally decided to buy a church. Right? So they bought a church that wasn't too far away. And uh, interesting to note that the church that they bought, there was a building on it already. Right? That building used to serve as, I think it was the conference back in the old times. Ellen White actually made to that building a few times. It's a really old building. If you were going there, you'd be, you know, it's, it looks old. And um, they said they decided to build a church. And uh, you know, they decided to take a loan out, buy the stuff, build the church and everything. And it came time, they were tired of paying the church off. And they said, you know what, let's just pay this thing off. Right? And my dad says that they dedicated themselves to a very small time frame in which people gave their whole paychecks to pay this church off. You know, and I was like, man, you know, I wonder if, if that would be possible today because it's a lot different back then than it is now. You know? But it, it's, it's a marvel just to hear things like that. It said people actually willingly sacrificed their, their income like whole two weeks, three weeks a month perhaps of income and said this is to pay the church off. You know, and, and it makes me think of, of what these people had to give. And it says, and they were doing this to build the tabernacle of God. It said, God had spoken and his children were to obey his voice. It said, they held nothing back. They just didn't give from their income, but a large part of their possessions were given. It said, they consecrated joyfully and cordially what they gave to God, and it pleased them to do so. It said, the people of God gave him the best that they had. It said, God would not accept 
when you remember the sacrifices, that God did not accept any blind, sick, or any lame sacrifices. But that goes without saying that God does not expect us to go beyond our limits, right? But to give as much as possible. To God, to give our best doesn't just apply in our possessions, but it also applies and extends into our abilities, our time, our strength that we have. It's in Christ's service there is a need of diversity of gifts and there is nobody too poor or too short on capability that cannot do their part. Amen. God has a work for everybody. Amen. When you look at this, what was the purpose of God for Israel in the construction of the sanctuary? We look at the couple purposes. There was a few purposes. One is that he wanted to lead the people as well as us into an understanding of the plan of salvation. All the ceremonies pointed to who? To Jesus. If you look at the verse in Psalm 77, verse 13, it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, right? So everything was pointing to Christ. The second one is that it prefigured Christ's coming to the earth, his ministry, death, ascension, and his final work that he's going to do and will do, that he was doing and will do. So that was the purpose of why it was done for Israel's behalf. Next question is, why is it important to understand this subject? Why do we even need to you know, deal with it? One is to understand clearly the subject of the sanctuary and the judgment. Second is in the heavenly sanctuary we find the exact center of, uh, or the center of the exact work that Jesus is doing on behalf of man. The intercession of Christ in the sanctuary is essential to the plan of salvation, which means how we are saved, and his death on the cross. Here is where a lot of people miss the point of the importance of his current ministry. People don't understand what Christ is doing right now. You ask him and he said, well, what is Jesus doing right now? A lot of people don't know. We have a special, we as Adventists especially have that answer. You know, and it's, we are obliged to give the answer and tell them this is what Christ is doing on our behalf at this very moment. And lastly, I said the correct understanding of Jesus' ministry in heaven is the foundation of our faith. As Adventists, we know that 1844 has a very specific significance for us, which shows us and points to exactly the work that Christ is doing in that most holy place. Now, there was some similarities, and then you're going to see them right now, when we just talked about the sanctuary, on, on, on the, you know, the, the, the one that Moses had, and now we're going to talk a little bit about Solomon's temple. I want you to see some similarities between the two. So when we ask, and he said, the Solomon's temple, what was the reason now that, uh, for constructing this second temple, right, which is known as the second temple? What was the reason it did it? Let's go at 1 Kings. Or uh, sorry, First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1. This will give you the answer. Why was this temple constructed? First Chronicles. And we're going to look at chapter 17 and verse 1. First Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1. And it says, Now it came to pass... As David sat in his house, that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. King David had a desire, right, in his heart to say to himself, he said, look, look at me. He said, I have this beautiful temple. I have this beautiful house. It's made out of cedar, which is probably a really nice wood, which I see around here a lot, and it really smells really good, you know. And it, it I mean, it's... It, and to, to, to David, in his mind, he said, you know what? God's presence is, is sitting behind curtains, right? How fair is that, in his mind, he was saying. So he desired in his heart to construct or to build a temple for the Ark of the Covenant, where we understand that between those two cherubim was whose presence? God's presence, right? Now, David desired to do this thing, but we know that he was not permitted to do this. Why was that? The Bible tells us there were some specific reasons why God did not permit David to build this temple. One of them was the Bible says he was not permitted because he had shed too much blood, right, due to the constant battles he was engaged in. And we can find them in the first Chronicle 17, 2 to 3 and the second Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And they said David's intentions were well placed, but God had what? Different plans. David's plan was that Jerusalem would be the center of worship for all the nations. Moses said had indicated that there should be a central place of worship, which there was when he was, uh, you know, when they were in the desert. 
So David purposed to realize that this instruction by edifying a beautiful temple was proportionate to the honor and the glory that God deserved. So David understood and said, you know what? God deserves this. You know? And if you keep on reading through, it, it kind of says that God is kind of implying, you know what? It's nice that you want to build me a temple, but God in a sense is saying, I don't need it. Does God need a physical place to dwell? No, Israel, he was doing everything for Israel just fine. He was winning the battles for Israel on his behalf. He was doing the things for David on his behalf, and it, was, it wasn't needed to build it. But God said, you know, if you're going to build it, you know, here, here's, my, here's my stipulations. Now, he had told David no, but who had he told yes to? He said, God chose a candidate for this job, and even before Solomon was born, it said that God told David that Solomon was to be the one that was going to build the temple. Now, see some similarities here. God, you know, has a specific purpose for doing a certain thing. Now we're going to see another similarity. When he said, what was the call that was made to the people in the construction of the temple? Let's look at 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 5. It was no different than what we saw previous. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 5. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 5, it says, the gold, of the, uh, the gold for things of gold and the silver for things of silver and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of the artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day to the Lord? Verse 6 says, Then the chief of the fathers and the princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work said, Offered what? Willingly. Willingly. And gave for the service of the house of the God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams, and of silver 10,000 talents and of brass 18,000 talents and of 100,000 talents of iron. And it goes on to say, it said, verse 9 said, Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. So we see a, a similarity, right? When God asked the Israelites, when they had come out of Egypt, He asked them to give them an offering what? Free will. Again, with the building of the second temple, He asked the people to give them an offering again of? Free will. Right? So God, in doing these things, it's not so much that God needs the money, but it's more for us. Right? Because we've got to learn to let go, and, and, and we've got to learn to give God what is His. You know, that's why, you know, when we talk about paying, not even paying tithes, but returning tithes to God, right? And I'm sorry I caught myself there. But uh, for returning tithes, returning to God what is due, it's not so much that God needs the money. It's always more for us, you know? And we see the similarity that God is asking his people to give a voluntary offering. The second similarity, who designed the plan for the temple? Let's look at First Chronicles in this chapter right before. First Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 19. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 19. And it says, All this said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. So who gave the pattern to the sanctuary to David? God. So when we see the both instances, God gave the plans, and it wasn't anything that was derived by man, but God decided to say, you know what, if you're going to do this, Here's the plan, and it's going to come from me, and you're going to have to execute it exactly as I tell you. Now, let's look at another aspect. Now, let's, let's go a little bit and delve a little deeper into the construction of Solomon's temple. There was another thing. After they had decided and they had taken up the money, you know, what do you usually do after you have the money for building a project? You get what? What was that? Materials, right? So materials were gathered, but after that, what do you need to build it? You can have materials thrown all over the place. You need what? Workers, right? Okay, workers. So, you know, the next thing is, is Solomon needed to find people to build this thing. Okay? So, when we see that the election of the workers, it said, who elected the artisans and the labor for the building of the temple? This is where things start to turn a little bit south, you know, in, in this story. You know, when you see in 1 Kings chapter 5, verses 3 to 6, and 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, 3, 7, 13 through 14, it says that Solomon decided to say, you know what, I'm going to find the workers for this temple, right? When we look in and we compare that with Moses, 
Who picked the workers for Moses? God did. In this case, Solomon is saying to himself, you know, I'm going to find the workers this time. You know, I'm going to find who I want to build this temple. And it said these, and, and, and just to kind of read, I'm going to read you a quote. It said, these, it said, who are these men and what sentiments ruled their characters? This comes from the book uh, uh, Prophets and Kings. And it's interesting to note that these men that Solomon had called were actual descendants of Be Bezalel and Aholiab. Do you remember who those two were? They were the people that had originally been called to build the first tabernacle. And these men were descendants of them. So listen to what it says. It said, For the construction of the wilderness tabernacle, chosen men were endowed by God with special skills and wisdom. Moses said unto the children of Israel, See that the Lord hath called by name Bezalel, the tribe of Judah, and he hath filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Aholiab, the tribe of Dan. Then hath he had filled the wisdom of the heart to work all manner of work. And it goes on to describe what he did. Now, re listen to this. It said, The descendants of these workmen inherited to a large degree the talents conferred to their forefathers. For a time, these men of Judah and Dan remained humble and unselfish. But gradually, almost imperceptibly, they lost their hold upon God and their desire to serve him unselfishly. They asked higher wages for their services because of their superior skill as workmen in the finer arts. In some instances, their request was granted, but more often, they found employment in the surrounding nations. In place of the noble spirit of self-sacrifice that had filled the hearts of their illustrious ancestors, they indulge a spirit of covetousness, of grasping for more and more. That their selfish desire might be gratified, they used their God-given skill in the service of heathen kings and lent their talent to the perfecting of works which were a dishonor, dishonor to their maker. It was among these men that Solomon looked for a master workman to superintend the construction of the temple on Mount Moriah. Minutes, minute specifications in writing regarding every portion of the sacred structure had been entrusted to the king. And he could have looked to God in faith for consecrated helpers to whom he had been granted special skill for doing with exactness the work required. But Solomon lost sight of this opportunity to exercise faith in God. He sent to the king of Tyre for a man cunning to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in iron and in purple and crimson and blue and that can skill to grave with the cunning men in Judah and Jerusalem. The Phoenician king responded by sending Hiram the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre. Said Hiram was a descendant of a mother's side of Aholiab, to whom hundreds of years before, God had given special wisdom for the construction of the tabernacle. Thus, at the head of Solomon's company of workmen, there was placed a man whose efforts were not prompted by an unselfish desire to render service to God. He served the God of this world, Mammon. The very fibers of his being were inwrought with the principles of selfishness. So this is the man that Solomon chose, right? As opposed to the man that God had chose. But Solomon, you know, I think at this point, it almost seems that Solomon was kind of picking somebody reflective of himself, right? And this man in no way was going to, you know, be of any help. But we can see that it ended up a disaster down the line if you keep on reading the story. But in this particular instance, we see where he deviated from the similarities in the way that the temple was constructed previously. Now, let's go in and, and, and let's start looking at the actual building of the temple. Now, how was the actual construction of the temple accomplished? It was a very interesting feat, the way that the second temple was constructed. Let's look at the first Kings chapter six, verse seven. And in there, it'll tell us the exact way that this particular temple was built. And it was different than most others. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. And for those who have it, uh, I'm going to read. It says, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7 says, And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in the building. Well, that must be really nice to not hear people building. Especially when you live in a city, you get woken up at 6 in the morning and jackhammers and bulldozers and sirens going on. And it's a mess when you hear people building and constructing, right? It's loud. It's usually not very quiet. But in this case, the Bible says that you didn't really hear a thing. It said all those things 
hammers, chisels, and all of these was done, it said, outside, thither meaning without, where the building was actually being done. Now, what kind of rocks were used in the kind, uh, are used and, 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 and used for the preparation, and what kind of preparation was done to them? It says in the Bible, it says, rocks of great worth and of price were prepared by the Giblites, the Bible calls them. They were called stone setters, right? And so I went back to look what the stone setters mean, and it was a tribe called the Giblites. And it's interesting, just as an interesting, just a thought, it said that root word comes from the word boundary setter, right? So just think about that. Now, who are the stone setters representative of? The Bible always has a meaning for something in the Bible. We can always find our meaning in something. So if we look at the book, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, who are these stone setters representative of? Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at uh, verses 11 through 13. And here it tells us, and it said, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying. Here's the word edify. What does edify mean? Building. Building up of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So these stone setters were basically doing what? Building up. Now, we're talking about a spiritual temple here, right? So who are these stone setters representative of? Us, right? Because he said that the Spirit, he said he gave those things for the edifying of the body of Christ. So those rock builders are, are representative of the servants of God. So if you are a servant of God, then you are representative of these stone setters that are building up this temple. Now, what do the rocks represent? Now, we have now we're going to get into some meanings here. What do the rocks represent, and how was the process of preparation? When you look at the rocks in 1 Peter, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Some of you might know that one by memory. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 tells us. First Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So who are the stones representative of? Us. Us right? Because we are building up. It says here this, we are lively stones, are built up a what? A spiritual house. And the process, what was the process of the preparation of these rocks? It was very interesting. It said the rocks were cut, they were hewn, squared, polished, and tested. It says here, the Jewish temple was built with carved stones taken from the mountain. Each stone, each piece was prepared for its place in the temple. You know, it's interesting to note how, how you know, exact this had to have been, right? Because you're building this on the outside and you have to come back and you better be sure that these rocks are going to fit perfectly, right? Um, I think about this in terms of engineering. Like, I, I work as an engineer. I'm, uh, that's my profession. You know, and, and I, I look when, when we work with things, you know, at least back when I used to design stuff, um, not so much anymore, but, I mean, you, you design stuff and you're talking about thousands of an inch, right? And to us, thousands of an inch probably wouldn't matter, right? And, and you, you look at, you know, tenth thousand, you know, you, you even get down to a tenth of an inch, four decimal places on the other side, right? And you say to yourself, man, does it even matter? And then you start building things together and things start not fitting. Right? Just because you were off by two tenths of an inch. Right? And, and you say to yourself, you're like, man, sometimes in your mind it's like, well, it doesn't matter, but it does. You know, and in here, it said that these were built and it said they had to be prepared for their place in the temple. It said they were hewn, squared, polished, and tested before being transported to Jerusalem. It said when all these stones were found in their terrain where they were going to be built, the construction was done in such a way that no noise was heard, not an axe nor a hammer. 
said the building represented the spiritual temple of God composed of material brought from all nations, tongues, tribes, people, social classes, great and small, poor and rich, wise or ignorant. These are not inert material that must be worked with a hammer and chisel. These are living stones taken out for the quarry of the world by means of the truth. Do you see the understanding here? God is pulling people out from that quarry. You know, and he's pulling them out. And it says that these people represent people that come from all kinds of places. He said, these are living stones taken out by the quarry of the world by the means of the truth and the great architect that is Christ is preparing them for their place in respect to the spiritual temple. He said, this temple when complete will be perfect in all its parts and will cause admiration by the angels and by man because God is the architect and the builder. Amen. Let no one think they are not in need of a blow or a strike. Sometimes we think that we're perfect, right? And we're not, right? Which is why the, 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 the admonition uh, via the Laodicean church is given to us, right? Saying, take heed, basically, the message because God is saying you're like this, but you think you're like that. Now, what does the process of the preparation of these rocks represent? I have a few things that I want to line out. First, it says the manner and the foundation in which our character should be built, meaning needed to be done. One of them is we need to be doing as God is instructing us. Second is that we need to glorify God and not self, which is what basically Solomon ended up doing. Ultimately took credit for everything. At the end, he was, you know, if you look at the story of Solomon, you know, and, and you read, God, he was always giving credit to God, saying God is this, God is that. And a little bit later, he said, you know what? This is, this is Solomon's temple. You know, in his heart, he decided to say, you know, this is my temple. And he let it get to his head. But God is saying that we need to glorify God and not self. Next is the specific instruction needed to follow exactly in all the work which was done needs to be done. He said, to show that the care in which was taken to build a temple is the same care in which we should put towards our own character building. Every part had to be perfect in relation to its counterpart. And that kind of reminds me that we are all stones, right? And we compose the church. And if we're not in unity, Amen. then we can't be together. Amen. You know, we're not going to fit, right? But God is calling us to be hewn, squared, polished, and tested to be able to fit together. Amen. Next, it says, no inferior materials were used. You know, um... Reminds me again of my engineering work, right? You know, you look at stuff and, um, you know, it's, it's fascinating when you work with stuff like 3D printing. How many of you have heard of that? You know, I've actually gotten to work with that. I've actually gotten to design, build, 3D print stuff, put it together. You know, and sometimes you'll be amazed at some of the stuff that the material is made out of. But you have to choose the material wisely, right? Because under duress, it could break, it could, you know, do a bunch of stuff. But the material has to be chosen wisely. And God says, you know, no inferior material was used. He said, when trials come, the inferiority of the materials would be laid bare as to what class of building materials were used to edify the building. Yes, true or not? God tests that. Next, we talked about the preparation, the process. There was a, a process to this. One of them, the first one, was, was to cut the stone. In Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 and 2, let's go there and let's read that. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. It tells us, it says, Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye were hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you, for I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. It said, when God had called Israel, if you remember the Bible says God called Israel not because they were the mightiest nation, were they? It said they were the what? They were the, yeah, right? And it said not because they were the mightiest or anything special. In fact, they were not very big or very strong. It said they had forgotten that the rock from which they had been cut and the hole that we, they, they, had, they had totally forgotten this. They had totally forgotten what, what, what the, the rock which they had been cut in, the hole they had been pulled out of. He said, God did not depend on them to fulfill his purposes. 
Just as he called Abraham out of a pagan land, he can call others to his service. Amen. So that's what cut means. Don't forget where you've been taken from and what God can do for you. Amen. Next is hewed and squared. For that, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, it says, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Hewed and squared. Do you know what hewing means? Anybody? Hmm? Yeah, cut down, right? Um, you can even call it maybe some part of carving, you know? And squaring, or square, squaring is probably making it square, right? But... Um, let me read you this, uh, th this quote here. It says, I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking into the time of the refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation, therefore they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them live in the sight of a holy God. It said, those who refused to be hewed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they need it to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. When does the hewing and the squaring need to happen? Now. Not then. A lot of people like to wait till the very end. You know, I'm still part of that, and God is working on me. You know, I'm a procrastinator type, right? But for this, there is no procrastinating. It's either you do it or you don't. But I thank God that he gives us these admonitions because there's still time, right? God, God is still working. You know, the next portion is we talked about cut, hewed, squared. Now we talked about polished. When we polish this, it said, it said, we develop our Christian characters by doing things that God asks us to do consistently and how he asks us to do it. It might be said that this polishing process sounds a lot like what? Sanctification, right? And that walk, that's what God basically does. He sets us and then he polishes us. He says, in the same way we take steps to form bad habits, we take steps to form right characters. God asks us to practice self-denial for the love of God, to take up his cross, and to work to save the lost. That is how we keep busy. That is how we keep polishing. So this is the process that God uses to refine and extract the inferior materials so that the end result will be the precious traits of character that appeared in Christ also appear in the believer. All the dross needs to be swept from the soul through the sanctification of the truth. Polished. Next portion is called the testing. It said, the fact that God calls us to go up against trials and tribulations said that God sees something special in us and precious is the, uh, in us and that he desires to develop. Have you seen, you know, some people, you know, uh, they're very selective, you know, you know, especially, you know, you talk about those music schools. Some people come, they listen, and then they take the people that they see the, what, the most promising, right? They said, these are the ones that can, they can't literally take care of everybody. It'd be impossible to say, hey, everybody, come on in. Right? You, you, you do your job and you find which is the best one. And you take those and you say, you know, I can work with this. Right? With God, it says here, under the tested portion, and that, is that God has something special and he sees something precious and he desires to develop that in us. He said, if he didn't see anything, he would not dedicate his time to putting us through the refining process. It'd be a waste. Nobody would subject something so precious to rigorous testing if they didn't think it was up to the task. And, in, you know, and when you talk about engineering also, we, like you said, you test things, and you do it with the specific purpose of testing the limits of something. You say, is this fit for this purpose? You know, I, I'm pretty sure everybody here drives a car, and, and I'm pretty sure you thank God that engineer did it right. right? Because when you go over certain things, and you, you know, you're, sometimes you feel like your car is going to fall apart, it didn't. Right? Because somebody had the good sense to do what? Test it. Right? They test it. That's what they do with all the cars as they roll off the manufacturing line, right? They test them to make sure that when you get them, it's not going to fail. 
Same thing that God does with us. God has always tested his people through the crucible of affliction. It does a few things to us. It does the process. It says separates the dross from the gold. It said in this case, the Christian character is purified and test really shows what kind of materials were used. It reveals the defects in the characters that were hidden from our sights. They go unnoticed. With that, it said God gives us an opportunity to correct those defects, and in doing so, he prepares us for his service. Amen. How many of us go down on our knees and ask God to show us our defects? If we don't, maybe that's something we should ask God for. And say, show me, Lord, where I'm defective so I can fix that. Next thing, it says, once we realize this, we learn to depend more on God, and he is ready and willing to help us. So the process might seem harsh. Sometimes we see something and we say, you know, we look away and he said, man, that is harsh. I don't want to see it. It is a harsh process. He said, but in the end, it said, it reveals a beautifully polished and prepared stone to occupy its place in the heavenly temple. God does not waste time on useless material. So all of us should feel some worth that God sees some worth in us that he's willing to work with us. So when sometimes you think you're useless, when sometimes you think you're worth nothing, God sees in us something that is worth it. And he's worth it to try to polish us. Amen. Let's go to the workers. The workers, who do they represent? They said, we are called to announce the virtues of our Lord Jesus Christ, building his church through his divine grace, and by the work of the Holy Spirit, developing the character of Christ. Christianity is living principle that takes possession of the mind, the heart, the motives, and the whole man. God, elect... It says, our, 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 our um, high priest, chosen and acquired by God, a holy nation, announcing the virtues of him who called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light, living rocks. The lesson we learn in the building of the temple is that we can become members of the family of God for a place where the Holy Spirit can dwell. And just to finish up, there's a few things I just want to bring out. It said, our surpassing beauty... It says, and this is a quote, it says, Of surpassing beauty and unrivaled splendor was the palatial building which Solomon and his associates erected for God in his worship. It said, Gardeners with precious stones surrounded by spacious courts with magnificent approaches and lined with carved cedar and burnished gold. Man, what a beautiful building this must have been. Right? With temple structure, with its broidered hangings and rich furnishings was a fit emblem of the living church of God on earth, which through the ages has been, build, has been building in accordance with the divine pattern with materials that have been likened to gold, silver, precious stones, polished after the similitude of the palace. It said, of this spiritual temple, Christ is the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. So just to conclude, I just want to bring out the points that we just kind of went over. You know, one of them, you know, God wants to have a temple in which he can dwell, and that temple is us. Second point is the temple is according to the model. Sometimes we want to do our own thing, right? Sometimes we want to build the building how we want. But it's God ultimately who tells us how that building should be built. Amen. So we need to look to Jesus for the pattern. Because we imitate another pattern, we're going down the wrong way. Third, the building should be according to the instructions. Now what instructions has God given us? Those Ten Commandments. Right? So as long as we live by those Ten Commandments, the building should be good. Participation in the building is voluntary, and all who want to take part in it can. But God will never twist your arm. He will never pull your hair. He won't pull you by the ear. He'll just ask you to say, willingly, will you serve me? Last and not least, they said we should not for or one of the last things, that we should not forget where we've been pulled from. You know, sometimes when people forget where they come from, they tend to forget a lot of things. You know, some of the things is just, you know, some people grew up in humble beginnings and something happened to them and they just completely forgot all that. Right? But for God, we have to remember where we've been pulled from. Next, it says, God calls by name those who are willing to work in consecrated and special services. It said, all workers who will be willing to be subject to inspection and instruct, it said, all workers should be willing to be subject to inspection and instruction by the master builder. 
Lastly, I just want to read a quote that I found in the book Child Guidance. I found this very interesting. It says, those who are defective in character and conduct and habits and practices are to take heed of counsel and reproof. The world is God's workshop. And every stone that can be used in the heavenly temple must be hewed and polished until it's tried a precious stone, fitted for its place in the Lord's building. But if we refuse to be trained and dis disciplined, we shall be as stones that will not be hewed and polished and that are cast aside at last as useless. It may be that much work needs to be done in your character building, that you are a rough stone which must be squared and polished before it can fill be fill it place in God's temple. You need not be surprised if a hammer and chisel, God cuts away the sharp corners of your character until you are prepared to fill the place he has for you. No human being can accomplish this work, only God can. Amen. He said, only by God can it be done and be assured that he will not strike one useless blow. Amen. His every blow is struck in love for your eternal happiness, he knows your infirmities and works to restore, not to destroy. So my friends and my brothers and sisters, this afternoon I leave you with that. You know, and I, I really hope and pray that we can work to become stones fitted for God's temple. That we may find ourselves, you know, with our brothers and sisters to be working perfectly together to be what God has ultimately called us to be. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again, dear Lord, for what you mean to us. Thank you that through your word you are able to teach us practical lessons on Christian living. We ask, dear Father, that you work on our hearts, that we might be hewed, polished, and tested, Father, for when that time comes we will be found ready, and all you have to do is just take us and fit us into that temple. I ask, Father, this prayer not just for myself, but for everybody here and also for their families as well. There's a lot of work that is left to be done, including on our own selves, and we ask you that you help in the Bible, like you said, you promised to fulfill or to finish the work that you started. We thank you, and we ask that your Holy Spirit, Father, bring to remembrance the, what we've learned today. We ask you all these things in your name I pray. Amen.